I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction on Tonsteine Scherben. I'm sure most of the German, Germans here are aware of who the Ton, who Tonsteine Scherben are. And um, I don't have to explain to them uh, a lot, but we have a few foreign guests here, so I have to explain who the band is. Then I'm going to go a bit into the theory, which for me is here uh, narrative research particularly and memory studies, which I'm then going to apply to uh, how the Scherben are dealing with their own past and how um, other people deal with the Scherben's past. And I'm, I've got two specific examples for that. One is a, a sort of boat tour on the River Spree in Berlin, organized by the association uh, Berliner Geschichtswerkstatt. And the other one is a book by former drummer Wolfgang Seidel, just called Scherben from 2005, which deals a lot with uh, the instrumentalization of uh, Tonsteine Scherben's music, which is then going to lead me into my conclusion. But just for a bit of an overview of who the Scherben are, or rather were, the Tonsteine Scherben were founded in 1970 on the basis of two different political theater groups, their early works, and these are the first two to three albums here on the side, were very politically charged, uh, and this political aspect of the music is less pronounced on later albums, but it's still very, very much there. The original members of the band were, of course, Leo Reiser, a very famous German musician who died in 1996, R.P.S. Lenrue, uh, Kai Sichtermann, uh, the bassist, and Wolfgang Seidel, the drummer. And later iterations of the band involved many more musicians. Incidentally, Wolfgang Seidel was replaced later by a couple of drummers, but mainly by uh, Funky Götzner, who will play a role later. Originally, the band was active between 1970 and 1985. There was a part reunion as uh, Neues Glas aus Alten Scherben around uh, the, the latest drummer, uh, Funky Götzner, in 1999. In 2004, Kai Sichtermann joined this reunion uh, as the bassist, and they played as TSS family. There was a full reunion, including Appiaz Lenrue, in 2012. And since 2014, the band has been active as Kai and Funky von Tonsteine Scherben mit Gimmick. Gimmick being uh, a singer-songwriter from Nuremberg who takes up the part of uh, Leo Reiser and Erfurt Lenrue, respectively. Uh, during their active time in the 70s and 80s, the Scherben uh, released five studio albums, uh, six singles, three live albums, and they were involved in a whole number of other projects. And the interesting thing about this is that the Scherben never were involved with any sort of mainstream labels. They, in, in fact, they founded their own labels. They did their own distribution via uh, a network of leftist bookstores and were so, in fact, DIY before the term or the concept of DIY even existed. That may be part of the reason why the Scherben were significantly influential in Germany way beyond the 1970s. There are, to date, more than 650 uh, official and collected uh, cover versions of uh, their songs from literally all genres of popular music. There are several books on the Scherben. I've counted about 10 um, on the Scherben and Leo Reiser and Connected Topics. There are at least three musicals. There are films, there are documentaries, and there is this boat tour I'm going to speak uh, about in more detail later. But before I'm going to do that, a brief look into my theory. Now I'm coming at this from narrative research, um, specifically coming here from Corinne Squire. And Corinne Squire argues that narratives are the means of human sense making. Uh, temporal orderings of human experience into narrative are not just characteristic of humans, but make us human. So what she's essentially saying here is that uh, narrativity is the basis of human interaction. We cannot explain the, the world to us, uh, to ourselves and to others in any other way than via sequ sequential storytelling, than via narrative. And obviously uh, people from memory studies agree, and Rick here is saying that uh, narrative is a key concept in cultural memory studies as well. And she further argues that narrative is a cognitive scheme, which is what, what I pointed out earlier, rather than the property of events. Uh, accordingly, experiences are not in themselves stories, but become narrativized through the application of models of storytelling, which in turn, um, which help turn events into meaningful structures. And it's these structures that we're going to be looking at into a bit more detail uh, in the context of the Scherben, with the help of another theoretical concept, uh, Barry Schwartz's keying and framing. No, I don't actually agree with everything that Barry Schwartz says in this article, but uh, that's beside the point. Uh, this is a very useful terminology for uh, analyzing certain connections that are made. And he uses keying and framing to explain how certain events in the present are connected to the past. An event in the present is keyed, is basically triggered, um, and connects to the past, which then frames the event of the present. So it's, um, it's a matching of the past 
and present. And uh, keep this in mind because this is going to happen quite a lot in, uh, in what uh, I'm going to be telling you about. And let's get right into it. Now, this is Scherben's latest iteration. This is the latest iteration of the band Tonsteine Scherben, Kai and Funky von Tonsteine Scherben mit Gimmick. So there's a bit of a distinction there. Uh, the band now plays as a, as a trio, usually. It's these three nice gentlemen here, Kai Sichtermann on the left, um, Funky Götzner on the, on the right, and in the middle, uh, singer-songwriter Gimmick. And they occasionally have guests uh, at bigger shows in Berlin, specifically, and at the boat tour as well. They play acoustic versions of the Sherm songs. I'm going to play some of those later. Um, they were founded in 2014 in this formation. They've been touring regularly since 2016. In 2017, they released the double CD uh, Radio für Million, which is uh, acoustic versions of Sherm songs. In 2019, and this is interesting, marks the re first release of new material of Tonsteine Sherm since 1983 with the release of the single Wir wollen in unserer Wohnung bleiben, wir bleiben drin and very much in keeping with the tradition of Tonsteine Scherben this is about squatting <laughs> and uh, yeah so um, but what I specifically want to talk about is this boat tour I mentioned and this boat tour again is organized mostly by the uh, association Berliner Geschichtswerkstatt now the Berliner Geschichtswerkstatt is sort of a memory association what they do is they do these boat tours they do other boat tours like um, Rebellious Berlin or Feminist Berlin, also on the River Spree. Actually, it's the same kind of track they, they do. Um, not as well visited as the Scherben one, but it doesn't matter. And they also do a sort of uh, oral histories of specifically World War II in uh, several Berliner Kieze. Um, and they, like, they do memory work, like they hang up plaques about uh, forced labor or resistance fighters, stuff like that. So it's a very memory culture focused sort of association. It's a like a history from below, uh, what it was called. And uh, rather than having me explain what the, um, what the boat tour is, I'm going to have one of them explain. This is Sima Binya explaining what this boat tour is. Jedes Jahr im August lädt die Berliner Geschichtswerkstatt alte Bandmitglieder von Tonstein Scherben zu einer ungewöhnlichen Reise mit dem Schiff. Wir erinnern mit dieser musikalischen Fahrt an den Sänger Rio Reiser, der am 20. August 1996 starb. Den Gesangspart übernimmt der Nürnberger Liedermacher Gübig. Der Schlagzeuger Frankika Götzner und Kai Sichtermann, Bandmitbegründer und Bassist, machen diese dreieinhalbstündige Schiffsreise über Spree- und Landwehrkanal schon seit 2008 mit der Berliner Geschichtswerkstatt. Im Gepäck sind Geschichten aus dem Bandleben und natürlich auch die alten Hits. Das Publikum, alt und jung, ist überraschend textsicher. Und den Scherben vorgelesen. Dieses Heim 
Highlight der Berliner Geschichtswerkstatt findet jedes Jahr an einem Freitag und Sonnabend um den 20. August jeweils um 18.30 Uhr ab Hansabrücke statt. Nähere Infos dazu auf www.berliner-geschichtswerkstatt.de oder www.scherben.net. I'm going to stop this here because otherwise uh, everybody's going to start singing along, um, uh, which would be fine too. We could also do that for the rest of the day. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, so this is quite a curious thing, isn't it? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a boat tour, it's uh, a concert, it's a historical lecture, it's a reading, and it's quite also obviously a party too. So there's a, a whole bunch of things that come uh, together here. and. Uh, makes for a very interesting setting. Incidentally, it's always super, super full. Um, I went there in uh, 2018, and they would actually only sell me a ticket uh, under the condition that it would not rain that day. Because uh, if when it rains, uh, apparently for security reason or something, the people on top of the deck, uh, here on, on the top deck, have to go to the uh, below deck, and then there's not enough space. So they actually checked their weather apps to see if it would rain, and then still sold me the ticket. But yeah. So um, let's just see what, this is one of the organizers, uh, Jürgen Kerbelat, who I interviewed. Um, uh, let's just see what, what he has to say about this event. He says, first of all, that this is, he views this clearly as part of his memory sort of work and the, the memory work that the Berliner Geschichtswerkstatt as an association is charged with or has charged themselves with. So this, uh, he thinks, uh, the commemoration of Rio Reiser specifically is squarely part of their topic. Um, and he says that specifically the older visitors, they come there for nostalgia, basically, for nostalgic reasons. They want to be reminded of their youth. Um, but there is also, and you've seen this, there's also quite a bit uh, of, uh, of a younger audience. And he says specifically because the music of Rio Reiser crosses generations. Uh, and it crosses over into the next generation, which is an interesting thing to say. Um, again, the event is extremely successful. It's, it's been taking place for over 10 years. It's always two nights in a row around the 20th of August, with one extra plan for this year, because this year marks the Scherben's 50th anniversary. Um, and the organizer views the event of very much as part of the memory culture that uh, they present and they promote in, in the context of the association. And once again, nostalgia is a major motivating factor, but there are also younger guests. And uh, the focus, uh, what I want to uh, focus on here is that he says that the music crosses generations. And we have seen this happens both in the audience and the band itself, both Gimmick and Anayana being a lot younger than the main protagonists of the band, uh, Kai Sichtermann and Funky Götzner. Now, what's, what does that mean? It certainly means that nostalgia as a motivating factor for enjoying the Scherben does not particularly work well for people who have been born past the 68 generation. So there's, there's a bit of a problem there. It's not really, it doesn't really work that well if you just try to explain this via nostalgia. And to illustrate this point, uh, I'm going to give you uh, another clip from a show in 2019 uh, from the legendary SO36, the punk club in Berlin, Kreuzberg. to continue. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's quite a bit of a party going on here as well, and as you can see, the SL36 is quite full. I was actually at this show and the one uh, the year before, which was similar. Both these shows were pretty much nearly sold out by a very diverse audience age-wise. So there were people like ranging from literally 14 to 70. Everybody was, was there. It's, it's quite interesting. And everybody's singing along. 
Interestingly enough, particularly to this song, because this song is uh, the Rauchhaus song, and it marks a very specific event in the history of Berlin, namely the, namely the squatting of the Rauchhaus, which incidentally is about 500 meters away from the SL36. So you can literally just walk there. Uh, and it's uh, one of Scherben's most famous songs, and uh, the relevant factor here is that it still gets pulled out uh, whenever there is a squatting somewhere. So it's basically the German squatting song. Um, Let's have a brief look at what Kai Sichtermann says. Now, this is from Kai Sichtermann's uh, autobiography. And he says he was initially reluctant after the death of Rio Reise to continue playing uh, Scherben's music. But then he kind of turned around on it. And um, now, he, when he plays the music, and he has a lot of younger people in the audience who sing along and are happy with the music, he says that for him, this is a big confirmation and affirmation. And he also, and this is interesting to me, sees still a societal necessity for, uh, for the music. He still sees the Scherben in the role of a sort of constructive provocateur, um, which is interesting. So he, he emphasizes that the presence of the young audience is one of the main reasons for him to still play this music. It's not about the older people wishing their youth back. It's about younger people and their sort of political energy. And it's about the uh, societal necessity, the timeless, uh, timeliness and the relevance <coughs> of that music today for today's democracy, as he says, that is for him the reason he still played. And he still considers the Scherben provocative in both the old and new material, as we have seen with the, with the new song. And as it turns out, quite a lot of people agree. Uh, this is uh, Wolfgang Seidel's book, Scherben. Again, Wolfgang Seidel was the first drummer of the Scherben. He left the band uh, after the recording of the first album in 1971. This is important, keep this in mind. Um, this is an anthology book. It uh, collects uh, articles from, from Wolfgang Seidel himself, but also by a number of journalists and musicians uh, and a whole bunch of other people um, who talk about approach, uh, approaches Scherben from various different ways, but specifically talk a lot about the use and misuse of Scherben's use music uh, after the end of the band in 1985, which is why that publication is kind of controversial or provocative in its own right, and knowing Wolfgang Seidel, he did that completely on purpose. Um, let's have a look at a few examples. I'm sorry for the, for the long quotes, this is what narrative research is. <laughs> uh, uh, so, um, uh, first we have uh, um, journalist Hartwig Wenz here arguing that today, and not just today, but basically in the last decades, the, the Scherben have been approached uh, appropriated uh, and co-opted from all sorts of political spectra and also from the uh, unpolitical quote-unquote mainstream the uh, Scherben werden heute von allen beansprucht and uh, yeah that is uh, it's quite true actually we'll look at a few examples of this look, this is uh, Francois Coutus a French German writer who says and this is a fairly benign example of uh, the use of the music of the Scherben uh, past their uh, past their end in 85 but she says that uh, the Scherben gets get used uh, at demos quite a lot. She specifically mentions prison demos, and I'm, sh I'm assuming she means like demos uh, protesting false imprisonment. She doesn't really make that clear, but yeah, that is a use that the Scherben music is, is put to, and I'm sure many of you have been to uh, uh, demonstrations in the past, and you will probably know that the Scherben still get played at these demonstrations quite a lot. Certainly at like, uh, anti-fascist or anti-AFD demonstrations, you will hear the Scherben. Uh, it's not, not really rare. So this is a fairly common use, specifically from the left. Um, there are, however, also uses from the right. In fact, the far-right NPD, and this is mentioned quite a few times in the book, the far-right NPD has used the music of the extremely left Tonsteine Scherben in uh, a couple of propaganda contexts, which is curious, but they did. There are a, a few songs of the Scherben, apparently, which uh, lent themselves to being instrumentalized by far-right propagandists. So there's political uses here. And then we have here uh, webmaster Robert Knieschke. Robert Knieschke is the webmaster of a homepage called riolyrics.de, which is a sort of archive and collection for uh, to understand share material, and he points out a few more sort of personal uses. Uh, the first thing he argues here is that uh, uh, people listening to the Scherben learn to be thankful for what was achieved in the 1970s, specifically pointing out the example that um, if people listen to a song like Verboten, a Rio Reiser song, they learn that homosexuality was uh, charged with prison sentences. Or uh, when call center workers listen to the song Slave, Slave, Slave Holder, 
um, they uh, remember the word that they wanted to use for their boss. So this is a more sort of personal use, uh, but also not particularly nostalgic. Um, and he also argues that uh, the Scherben uh, dissolved in 85, but the music kind of continued. And he mentions a whole bunch of inheritors of the Scherben, here mentioning specifically a whole bunch of hip-hop artists um, who did indeed cover uh, the whole kind of Macht für Niemand album in, in, in 2000. So there's, the mu music is also moving on into sort of different and transmorphing in different styles. So there's another use that we have, a sort of vaguely more economic use, I guess. And there's another use of the music, uh, or misuse, as Seidel would say, that Seidel himself uh, really does not like at all. And um, he says there's, uh, there was this tendency after the end of the Scherben to pull them into a political debate about music and national identity, it's essentially making the Scherben a German, a Deutschrock band, which uh, they never argue, uh, following Wolfgang Seidel, they never wanted to be. Uh, he said they, they didn't want to sing German, they wanted to be understood because they thought they had something to say. Again, this is something that Wolfgang Seidel says. Wolfgang Seidel left the band in 71. So, but he is that kind of person <laughs> who will point this out. And there's another use of this music, which honestly I'm just going to let play. <laughs> Siemens, Sharp, Pioneer, Phillips. Sauni, Sausung. Nee, stopp mal. Sony, Samsung. Bei dir klingt's alles wie Sau. Du, du machst so mit dem Pocher. Yeah, so this hideously obnoxious thing um, can only be from Media Markt. Um, yeah, so this actually caused quite a bit of controversy. This, this uh, advertisement came out in 2006, and um, there were, especially on the German uh, public left, there were people literally enraged about this, about the use, uh, about this, this use of the music, this uh, very, very definitely capitalist use of the music, to the point where Rio Reiser's inheritors, the estate of Rio Reiser, had actually to issue a statement uh, basically explaining that they had nothing to do with it and that it was in the contract and they couldn't do anything about it. Um, so, yeah, this is, uh, it's interesting that this, in 2006, causes such a controversy. And it, look it up. Uh, you, you'll find quite a lot of people arguing about that. Uh, so, following Zeidel, uh, uh, the music and the politics of the Shab are subject and were subject to multiple appropriations, ranging from the individual and benign, as we have seen, to the more collective and harmful, and I would say um, the usage of the music by the far-right NPD is, can be easily considered harmful. Um, the book indeed uh, represents an attempt to control this sort of legacy, to control this sort of narrative of the Sherman by calling out these appropriations and essentially saying uh, this is not what the Sherman would have stood for, and again, this is Wolfgang Seidel saying this, who left the band in 71. Um, so, there's somebody here trying to control the narrative, and what this conflict illustrates is that the music and the history of the Scherben are still extremely political, politically relevant and politically useful. And Seidel himself is quite a lot criticized for his attempts to control the narrative. There's one particular example, Hollow Sky, uh, writing a biography in uh, Frio Reiser in 2006, uh, but there's numerous <laughs> examples of, uh, of uh, criticism facing Seidel on this front. So. Um, I'm coming to my conclusion now. I think what is obvious here is that uh, narratives do things. They constitute realities. They shape the social rather than being determined by it. The fact that Tomstein uh, and are still such a popular band in Germany, that they have this boat tour, that there's this, all these arguments, that there's theater pieces on this, uh, mean that, there's a, that they're still very relevant. And it's not just because of their music, but also because of their history. And that, that history of, uh, of the Scherben in different narrative formats, in books, in boat tour, theater, documentaries, uh, is a valuable economic commodity for the band and the people related to it. Likewise, the music remains uh, an economic commodity, but it's also used as a political tool by diverse actors uh, because the sort of memory it carries, the, the sort of memory keys it carries, or the memory triggers it carries, is extremely useful for that particular, pur uh, that particular purpose. Uh, the, the reverberations it, uh, it carries uh, 
are keyed by present actors to frame their present context as a sort of radicalism, because what is keyed here is particularly the association of the Scherben with music and radicalism, not particularly what the Scherben actually wanted, as we've seen in the example of the NPD, but really just with the radicalism that is associated with the Scherben. And that way, uh, the, the narrative framing is used to co-opt the legacy of the Scherben, and it's used to constitute narrative realities based on these reverberations. And furthermore, and this is Anne Rigney speaking, memories must be kept alive uh, through repeated acts of recall if they're not to, to be de facto forgotten. The key to memory is not storage, but the capacity of a particular story to stimulate its own reproduction in a new form and to procreate. And in this context, nostalgia, as we've seen at the boat tour or the concerts the Scherben play all over Germany, are fairly productive because the music is still brought uh, into the people. It's still celebrated quite a bit, as we've seen. Uh, this can be considered following Svetlana Boim, uh, respect, uh, reflective nostalgia. Um, as part here of a procreation of a certain memory, of the memory of the Sherman, in a more specific way than just the aspect of radicalism. But nevertheless, uh, I felt that specifically that terminology of, uh, of nostalgia and retromania uh, too wielding and precise. This, I started out with this and I tried to analyze it, the, this, this complex situation with it. It did not work out for me. To my mind, the music and the narrative legacy of the Scherben uh, is used in various and diverse ways. And nostalgia is just one mode and one aspect of the reception here. And there's so much agency carried into the music from the various sides that to simply call the usage of the, the music purely nostalgic or retromania is to ignore the scope of its meaning and the relevance today. Thank you.